Hi everybody, welcome back to Creation Myths. Today we are going to cover another creation myth. This time it's the idea that mitochondrial Eve, the human mitochondrial most recent common ancestor, existed just 6,000 years ago. Obviously this is a pervasive myth among creationists and creation scientists because here we have seemingly robust genetic data that support a young earth timeline. As we'll see, that's not the case at all. So let's get into it. Before we get into what creationists say about this and why it's wrong, we have to introduce the topic. So the question we want to address today is how far back in the past did the human most recent common ancestor for mitochondrial DNA exist? Now remember, the mitochondria, that's the powerhouse of the cell. It's those little things that are always orange in the textbook drawings that make ATP. They have their own DNA because they were formed via endosymbiosis. And you only inherit the mitochondrial DNA from your mom because all the mitochondria that an embryo gets comes from the egg cell rather than the sperm. For this reason, it's really easy to track mitochondrial DNA back through generations. So we can look at the sequences of everyone's mitochondrial DNA and work backwards in time to see where they converge. That's called the most recent common ancestor. So related, we have two questions we have to cover. One, what is a most recent common ancestor? And how do we determine when a most recent common ancestor existed? And by the way, we're gonna use the abbreviation MRCA for most recent common ancestor. So most recent common ancestor just refers to the most recent individual from whom all members of a living group are descended. So if we look at this figure, we have all living humans. These are the seven billion and change of us right now. And you go back in time, eventually for each part of our genome, you're going to hit an MRCA. That's the most recent common ancestor for whatever part of the genome you're looking at. What we want to know is how far back in time do you have to go before you hit that most recent common ancestor. Now, there are a number of important notes about MRCAs that we need to clear up before we keep going, because there are a number of very common misconceptions about this concept. MRCAs are not the first member of a species. So if you look in this figure here, this represents just a simple uh, group of individuals over 10 generations. The black dot here represents the most recent common ancestor of this population. Down here, the bottom row, that is the current living population. Up here, this is an ancient population. So the black dot represents the most recent common ancestor, and the blue dots are all descended from that ancestor. Now you notice that that black dot is not the first member of the species. It's also not the only individual of the species that's alive at the time. There's lots of other individuals that are alive at the same time, they just don't have any living descendants. Finally, the most recent common ancestor is not constant in time. It changes with each generation. So in this figure, the black dot represents the most recent common ancestor for this generation right here. But if you were to go back in time and look at this generation or this generation, you're going to find a different most recent common ancestor. Putting aside all of the stuff we're gonna talk about here, getting into like the specifics of the genetics of calculating this kind of thing, putting all that stuff aside, the creationist story when it comes to the most recent common ancestor doesn't make sense because creationism requires that that common ancestor is always the same person at the same time. In real life, it's going to change, and with each generation, the most recent common ancestor is going to move forward in time. Another really important note is that any one most recent common ancestor you're looking for, whether it's the mitochondrial DNA or the Y chromosome, those things are not the MRCAs for the rest of the genome. Every part of the genome has its own most recent common ancestor. So for example, today we're talking about the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor, mitochondrial Eve. But there's also the Y chromosome most recent common ancestor, Y chromosome Adam, and the convergence date, the time to the most recent common ancestor for Y chromosome Adam, is different from the time to mitochondrial Eve. They don't match up. This is important because we're going to be talking about uh, a guy named Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's calculations when it comes to mitochondrial Eve, and we'll talk about why those are wrong. But even if you take him entirely seriously, you just apply his same techniques to other parts of the genome, and you're going to get answers that are too old for a young Earth timeline. His math doesn't even work if there's nothing wrong with it just by doing the same math, which obviously must be valid since he does it for the mitochondria. You do it for other parts of the human genome, and you're going to get dates that are too old for a young Earth timeline. So how do we calculate the time to a most recent common ancestor? 
Well, we do a thing called coalescence analysis. And basically what you're doing is this. I'm oversimplifying here, but this is basically what we're doing. We take two samples. We have sample number one and sample number two. We sequence whatever DNA we want from them and we tally up the differences. How many differences are there between those two samples? And what we want to do is work backwards in time, so to speak, until they converge at a common ancestor. And that's our most recent common ancestor. Now, the question we need to ask is, given the number of differences that it would take to get from that most recent common ancestor to each of our samples, how long would it take to accumulate those differences in each lineage? That time is called the time to most recent common ancestor, or TMRCA. And that's what we're trying to calculate here for mitochondrial Eve. In order to do this calculation, you need to know something called the substitution rate. Now, this is different than the mutation rate, and these two terms are sometimes used interchangeably, and that is incorrect. A mutation rate is just the rate of change in a DNA sequence. Basically, anytime a base changes in the DNA, that's a mutation. And we measure the mutation rate in terms of mutations per site per replication. So basically for any given location, any single base in the DNA, what's the rate at which it changes each time that DNA is replicated? And you end up with a very low number. Now those are not useful for calculating the time to most recent common ancestor. To calculate TMRCA, you need to use the substitution rate. This is the rate at which changes accumulate in genomes over time. This is measured in substitutions per site per year. And in this case, substitution just means a mutation that persists. It becomes fixed in a lineage. So it's substitutions per site per year. We do this per year because it normalizes for things like generation time. So you can calculate across different species or you could compare across different species that has different generation times. You could still make an apples to apples comparison by using substitutions per site per year. This is useful for calculating the time to most recent common ancestor because as we'll see, it only includes the mutations that are actually accumulating in those two lineages we sampled from. So let's look at why this matters. In any organism, in any population, some fraction of the mutations that occur are not going to be passed on to offspring. So we could look at it like this. You have your parent, you have your offspring. Now, some of those mutations that occur, each arrow represents a mutation here. Some mutations in the parent or the parent generation, depending on your perspective, are going to be inherited in the offspring. But many mutations that occur will not be inherited. And this is particularly important if you're multicellular, which we are, and that's what we're dealing with with the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor. Humans are multicellular. In multicellular organisms, the vast majority of mutations that occur are called somatic mutations. These occur in tissues that are not your germline. The germline tissues are the tissues that make gametes, sperm and egg. Any mutation that occurs outside of the germline can never be passed on to offspring. You could have mutations in the epithelium lining your stomach, you could have mutations in your skin cells, you could have mutations in your neurons. None of those mutations will ever make it into your offspring. The only mutations that matter are the germline mutations. So this difference of using mutation rate, which is all of these mutations, versus substitution rate, which is just the mutations that are inherited, matters when you're trying to calculate the time it would take for a certain number of substitutions to accumulate. This technique also requires calibration. We're trying to figure out the years in the past to the most recent common ancestor. But in order to do that, we need to know the rate at which substitutions accumulate. So we can look at samples that have differences that have a known date between them. And that allows us to say, okay, when did they diverge from each other? And then use that number to calculate our substitution rate. Basically, we're gonna take samples with a known time between them. We know when these two things split apart from each other. We'll calculate the number of substitutions between them. Then we can just use the number of years to calculate the substitution per year. And then we can apply that rate to our larger sample to figure out the time to the most recent common ancestor. The way we do this is by using known settlement events because we have a really robust history of when humans settled in specific places. Now, I wanna be very clear about this because it's a very common argument that creationists use and it's completely wrong. This type of math is not based on evolutionary assumptions. 
In many creationist circles, calibration in this context is a dirty word. They're saying basically, well, you're fudging the numbers to make it work for your evolutionary worldview. No, that's not true. Creationists accept that humans migrated around the world. I don't think anybody disputes that. And what we're doing here is we're using the dates of human migration to calibrate the rate of substitution. So for example, we can look at genotypes. We can look at specific mitochondrial sequences that are correlated with specific migration events. And that sets an upper bound on when that specific genotype could have appeared. We can then use that upper bound to calculate our substitution rate. So for example, the settlement of Europe was about 45,000 years ago. The settlement of Japan was about 32,000 years ago. And all these are from a 2009 paper, Soros et al. Now, I know what you're thinking, creationists. Wait a minute, I don't accept those numbers because the world was created 6,000 years ago. Okay, fine. Let's throw these well-documented, archeologically supported numbers out in the trash. Let's just get rid of these numbers. Let's use the settlement of the Pacific Island of Vanuatu 3.2 thousand years ago, or the Canary Islands just 2.3 thousand years ago. Presumably creationists have no problem with those numbers, and when you calibrate your substitution rate to those numbers, you get the exact same answer as when you calibrate it to the settlement of Europe or the settlement of Japan. So no matter which way you look at it, substitution rates are empirically determined. And we could even do it within a young earth time frame. So young earth creationists shouldn't have anything to complain about here. We're operating well within the post arc radiation of humanity around the world using events that they agree happened because at some point humans had to colonize the Pacific islands, for example. So presumably we all agree that that happened in the recent past. Okay. So these are not based on assumptions. These substitution calculations are not just made up. These are empirically observed substitution rates that actually work within a young Earth time frame. So the overall process is this. You have your two samples, you figure out how many differences there are between them, and you can work backwards to that most recent common ancestor. We know the divergence time, so we can calculate the substitutions per site per year for that, for that event. Now, we don't expect the human mitochondrial mutation rate or substitution rate to change that much over time. It's going gonna, it's gonna to remain within a range. So we can then apply that substitution rate to overall human mitochondrial diversity. Ta-da! There's your mitochondrial time to most recent common ancestor. All we do is take very divergent human mitochondrial genomes, basically the most divergent ones you could find, the maximum number of differences, and say, how long would it take? for that number of differences to accumulate using our empirically calculated substitution rate. We do that math and we work backwards to get our time to most recent common ancestor. Now I know this was a long introduction, but now we're into the part where we could actually talk about the creationist math that goes on here. So part two, Jensen versus reality. First, we'll talk about Nathaniel Jensen, who is a writer for AIG, that's Answers in Genesis, and he calculated in 2015 the uh, time to most recent common ancestor for the human mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial Eve. Uh, this paper, paper, it wasn't peer reviewed, but this paper was called A Young Earth Creation Human Mitochondrial DNA Clock. Whole mitochondrial genome mutation rate confirms D-loop results. And to calculate these, uh, these numbers, Jensen used data from uh, Ding et al. 2015. Um, and I'll link this stuff in the, in the description, but basically these are pedigree data. So what he's doing is he's comparing uh, parents to offspring, looking at the number of mutations that are different. I do want to point out something that creationists do all the time. It's that they don't gather their own data. They just misrepresent other people's data. And this is a, a textbook example of that right here. So what is Jensen doing? Well, we're looking at parents and offspring were surveying the, the diversity in the mitochondrial DNA in each one, and then just tallying up the differences, what things are present in one and the other that are different from each other. And then from there, we can just multiply those number of differences because that's one generation. You could multiply that based on an approximately 20 year generation to get the total number of changes uh, over whatever amount of time you want to look at. You could predict basically how many changes you should see over certain amounts of time based on this rate. When you do this, you arrive at a time to most recent common ancestor of about 6,000 years, meaning using the rate that Jensen calculated, it takes you 6,000 years, give or take, 
to get to the range of uh, diversity that you see in the human mitochondrial genome. Now, as you can imagine, there are some problems here. There are, in fact, a lot of problems here. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to cover the big problem that invalidates Jensen's entire study here. The problem is that he uses mutation rates, not substitution rates. So when you're looking at the differences between a parent and their child, when you're trying to calculate the time to most recent common ancestor for different lineages, the relevant things are the substitutions that accumulate from generation to generation. So the mutations that occur in the genome and are subsequently inherited by offspring. Those are the mutations that are going to accumulate over time. What's not relevant are the mutations that don't accumulate. Either they are somatic mutations, meaning they don't occur in the germline, or they are mutations that occur in the germline but are not inherited. Because even in the germline, most things aren't going to get inherited. Jensen includes all that stuff, even though it's not relevant, because within a study like this, that's just a pedigree study looking at parent versus child, you can't tell what somatic versus germline, and Jensen doesn't account for that. He doesn't even try to. As I will show you later, he himself makes that very clear. The result here is that he overcounts mutations, which means you get more mutations per generation, which means the total number of differences can be accounted for in a shorter amount of time. This leads to a more recent, most recent common ancestor, according to Jensen. We can look at the problem here schematically very easily. If you're looking at all the mutations here, the mom right here is going to have these three mutations that are different from the daughter. The daughter is going to have these three that are different from the mom. So that's six, plus the daughter has this germline mutation that's also different from the mom. Now the mom has this germline mutation, but that's going to be the same as the daughter because the daughter inherits it. So if we're looking at the differences just in terms of substitutions here, the answer is one. It's this single substitution that's going to be different. But if we're looking at overall mutations, it's going to be a difference of seven. Three somatic mutations in mom, three somatic mutations in the daughter, and one germline mutation in the daughter. A difference of one versus seven, or a sevenfold difference in the rate of mutation accumulation. That's the problem with Jensen's math. Now, like I said, there are other problems here, but like that's the big one, and the other problems don't really matter at the end of the day. This is enough to invalidate Jensen's findings. Now, the correct date for the human uh, mitochondrial most recent common ancestor, mitochondrial Eve, is between 60 and 200,000 years, give or take. There's a bunch of papers that go into this. Uh, they all return ranges that are kind of overlapping. Some of them are on the longer end, some of them are on the shorter end. It depends on the specific techniques, but you get something at a minimum that is 10 times further in the past than Jensen's calculation, and that all comes down to using substitution rates versus mutation rates. And I want to emphasize the, these studies all use empirical substitution rates. And you can go and read them and you can see how they do it. It's not actually that complicated. And that's it. That's the whole problem. Jensen uses mutations rather than substitutions, and therefore he arrives at a number that is at least 10 times more recent than it should be. It seems simple, right? Like, that's not, that's not that complicated. You're right, it's not. Jensen just does the technique wrong, and here's the best part. He knows it. In the piece that I mentioned earlier, the 2015 piece, I gave you the title earlier, and I'll, I'll give you the link down in the description, he writes, he concludes with this, the only remaining caveat to the present results is whether the mutation rate reported in Ding et al. 2015 represents a germline rate rather than a somatic mutation rate. To confirm germline transmission in the future, the DNA sequences from at least three successive generations must be sequenced to demonstrate that variants were not artifacts of mutation accumulation in non-gonadal cells. That is a disclaimer, everybody, okay? If you are a biologist, you read that and go, okay, so you're just saying all the math you just did just doesn't matter. If you're not a biologist, you read that and go, okay, there's more work to do. There's some caveats. That is a disclaimer. He is saying right there in black and white that the math that he just did, the stuff that he just calculated, the 6,000 year age for mitochondrial leave, he's saying right there that the data he used to do it cannot be used to make that type of calculation. It's right there in black and white. He's not aiming this paper at a scientific audience. 
Because that type of thing, a scientific audience would catch, because it's blatantly obvious. He's aiming this at a non-scientific audience, trying to convince them, oh, look, we have math on our side, and by the way, don't you know, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Okay, that's the trick that Jensen is playing right here. So to summarize, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen purports to show a recent mitochondrial most recent common ancestor in the neighborhood of 6,000 years ago. He made this determination based on the data from a pedigree study, ding it all 2015, but as I've shown, those data are completely inappropriate for this technique, and what's more, Jensen knows this and acknowledges it in that specific publication. If you do the math correctly, the actual human mitochondrial most recent common ancestor, mitochondrial Eve, existed between 60 and 200,000 years ago. This is based on observed substitution rates calibrated within a young Earth time frame. So as long as you do the technique correctly, young Earth creationists have no reason to doubt that number except for the fact that it directly refutes the young earth timeline and that's why you get people like jensen misrepresenting studies and doing bonkers fake math to come up with an earlier most recent common ancestor so mitochondrial eve six thousand years ago that is a myth and now i hope you know why so thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed this debunking of a six thousand year age for mitochondrial eve if you enjoyed this, please subscribe and share. Share with your friends who I'm sure also enjoy spending time arguing with creationists. Who doesn't love doing that? It's fun. I'll be back soon with more creationist tricks, creationist myths, and maybe a debate here and there. Thank you for watching. Don't get fooled.